Converge family, hello and welcome to our virtual service. We haven't done this for a while. You're probably thinking, is there a COVID outbreak that I don't know about? Are we in lockdown? Because that's when we started doing these. But, but no, I actually learned a Bible lesson late last year at a conference that I was at, realizing and embracing how much has changed as far as being the church. And there is, are lots of you that found church, discovered faith together in the church context during COVID in digital places and in uh, virtual spaces. And so I, rather than like record a message on a weekend and then you get the chance to peer in from the distance a few days later, I, I want us to provide like a chance for you to have a, a, a tailor-made message that's made for you, whether you're out walking the, the kids or the dogs, which can feel the same sometimes, <laughs> or you're on your drive to work, you're in a commute, you're, you're traveling and you're just getting caught up. I wanted to create a space that, that's not me talking to the, the, the church, you know, that gathered on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening, but, but talk, to, talk to you in this space. And so you might hear, I've got my dog here, Roxy, in my office with me, and so she might make some noise, and so that'll be the trade-off from the noise that would be in a, in a theater or in a live service. And, and so I want to start the New Year's message uh, with, a, with a thought about brand new things. That's not, you're probably like, well, that's the right message. It's like saying I'm going to preach about Jesus' birth on Christmas, which we did that as well. But I want to do a New Year's message on a message that's going to go live for you on January 1st. I want to call it turning the page. Like when I don't know about you, and actually behind me is a, if you're watching this and not listening on a podcast, behind me is a bookshelf uh, that's got a bunch of books in it. My office was across the street, same same owners, same complex, but just now I'm in a different space that's a little bit bigger for our team to meet and and rally and brainstorm here. And and so there's some guys from church that were very generous to help get me moved from that space to this space. And it was Jim Outman or Kevin Weiss, one, that as they're carrying these big moving bags of books, they, they said, probably out of breath, do, do you even read these books? And, and I kind of sheepishly, I have great intentions to read these books. And I, and I start reading many of them. Well, I'll, I'll order it or I'll pick it up because I'm, I'm preaching towards a thought. And so I want to do some research, but, but most of the time I don't finish them. I don't know if you're a book finisher if you start a book with great intentions, maybe you're the kind of person that just can't put a book down. But I find myself at some point in the book having a hard time turning the page. And that's, that's the name of the message, turning the page. We, we, we get stuck sometimes in what the current is that we have a hard time re reminding ourselves that, that God is wanting to do new things. Like, like in, the, in the service this weekend, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the church or ask the church to constantly be amening or attaboy or good looking out, dude, uh, whenever I say that we serve a God that wants to do a new thing. Like we serve a God that wants to do a new thing. And I don't know if this is gonna be awkward, you might just be sitting on a park bench next to somebody, but I, I want you to say, uh, maybe you can mumble it under your breath, amen, or I hope so, or man, uh, you're, you're talking to me today, but, but we have a God, we serve a God, we have access to a God that wants to do a brand new thing, and we just gotta turn the page. We gotta be willing to see what's in the next chapter. It's the same with watching TV shows, it's the exact same. I, I, like, we started the last, the final series of Stranger Things, and just couldn't get it off, like things kept popping up, yet we love the Stranger Things series, but I don't know how many of you guys have half-watched series, half-watched episodes even, but what happens is, you know, like on the big cliffhanger, you know, like maybe maybe you're binge-watching a series and it's all there. I don't, my wife and I are notorious for like, we gotta watch one more. And we say that when there's like this cliffhanger moment where we can't wait to see what's in the next, episode but life isn't always like that sometimes life we don't want to know what's around the corner but sometimes things are just good the way that they are and we don't really want to stress messing up this thing that god's doing i want to i want to see if i can stir on as i've been stirred on some excitement to the new things that god wants to do because we serve a god that wants to do new things i won't ask you to say amen but maybe you can nod or or you can just say man dustin i i hope so so my hope for today is to remind you and I that we, you don't know the whole story. 
Your your story's not over yet. Like 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 take your pulse or or, or check your heartbeat. Uh, make sure you're breathing, and if those things are true, you there's more to your story. You don't know the whole story. So, friend, family, can I can I encourage you to to not make a judgment call about what you think the ending will be because you don't you don't know the whole story. God's wanting to do a new thing because we serve a God that does new things. I want to see if I can do three things quickly. I I appreciate the fact that you're checking in virtually. And so I don't want to I don't want to belabor this. I want to try to get to it, through it as quickly as I can. Uh, three things, as quickly as I can. Though if you've been around long, you know I'm not very good at that. So that's why I say as quickly as I can, because I just might not be able to. But but number one, uh, tension is where the best part of your story is birth. Uh, we know this when it comes to movies and books, right? Like, like, I don't really go to watch a movie or to read a book that has no conflict. Like, because out of the conflict is where the resolution happens, right? We, we know that every good story and, the, and every movie has some sort of a hero and a villain storyline. There's got to be this breakdown of sorts. And for me, like I've, I've said this before, for me, I want a car chase, a, a disgruntled FBI agent, maybe a, 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 a fired CIA agent. I, I need, I need, I need a, a, something to blow up. Uh, there's got to be something to do with some kind of gang or drive-by or something like. Like I, I like when, I like when the one guy single-handedly takes on a whole gang, almost dies, but somehow that that saves his family. I, I don't know. I, I like when there's a lot of conflict, and maybe you're like that. Like we go to movies because there's a conflict. Me, even in the feel-good movies, there's a breakdown, there's a loss, there's a there's a sickness, there's a diagnosis, there's a divorce, and and it's in that tension that that, that the resolution. The part that makes us come in the first place is birth out of that tension. My wife and I, we wrote a song, and uh, it's called Erosion. The word erosion is not anywhere in the song, but but maybe maybe you know this. Maybe you've been to a, sh a concert where my wife and I were, were singing the song, so maybe you know this story. I, I can't really belabor it, but just the song Erosion is all about these these landmarks like the Grand Canyon. You know, you know, the Grand Canyon, my family had the chance to go to the Grand Canyon as we moved out to California. and. And uh, sheesh, is there a more awe-inspiring place on the planet than the Grand Canyon? But the Grand Canyon is a product of, of rock and water warring together. Like rock and water went to war with each other and eroded the rock and it created these uh, gigantic chasms. And over time, water and rock became the Grand Canyon. We don't stand at the mouth of the Grand Canyon going like, oh my goodness, look at this water and rock. No, we don't know it, we don't know it as the conflict. We know it as what the conflict created. Same with things like the Painted Desert. Wind and rock warring together with all these natural elements that are making the side, the side of these canyons just with breathtaking colors. We know it as the painted desert, but we don't stand there and post while sitting here looking at the product of wind and rock. No, we, we know it as the painted desert. We know the beauty that the conflict brings. Because conflict brings beautiful things. It might take time and it might be a long process, but conflict can birth beautiful things. I, I can't I can't do a New Year's message without reading Isaiah 43, 19. Isaiah 43, 19 says, but forget all that. I wish I could preach what all he was asking. The prophet was saying, being the mouthpiece of God, I wish I could tell you all the things that he was asking them to forget because they were the, they were the, 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 the rescue of God's people, that God was showing up and making a way where there was no way. And then the prophet Isaiah says, to those amazing things that God did, forget them all. It's nothing compared to what I am going to do. In verse 19, for I am about to do something new. I'll hit the pause button and say, because we serve a God, we have access to a God, we are known by and we know a God who is in the business of doing new things. And the prophet Isaiah says, as the mouthpiece of God, I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? Man, how many times do we miss it? I think the prophet Isaiah was saying, do you not see it? I mean, he was talking to me. How Dustin, how quickly you miss it, how quickly you took, you put your eyes on the wrong things and you miss that I'm trying to do something. So the prophet Isaiah says, on behalf of God, don't miss it. Open your eyes, see that God is trying to do a new thing. He, it says, I will make a pathway through the wilderness. It doesn't say I'm gonna get rid of the wilderness. It's, I'm gonna make a pathway through it. I might as well quote it again. I've, I've quoted it in services now for the last it seems like every service since we launched in October that 
somewhere out of Psalm 23, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I've quoted Psalm 23 almost every service. It doesn't say you give me a way around the valley of the shadow of death. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will, I will fear no evil because you are with me. And the prophet Isaiah finishes up, I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. I'm not, I'm not going to get rid of the dry wasteland. I'm going to take the conflict, take the challenge, take the desert, T take the confusion, take the, the unknowns that feel so overwhelming and so daunting and you know, New Year's, maybe for you, it's not filled with great things. You just, you just wish it could all be over. Maybe for you, it's like, oh, wow, this is, I'm in an amazing season of life. Well, friend, God wants to do something new regardless where you find yourself right now because our God does new things. I I'll say this. I, I didn't come up with this. I heard a preacher say it and, and I had to unpack it and live with it. See, see if this resonates with you. Your tolerance for tension determines your potential for growth. Your tolerance for tension determines your potential for growth. Let me, let me see if I can explain it to you like this. If you, if you go to a, a personal trainer, and obviously I do, right? So, um, nope. Um, but if you go to a personal trainer and, and that personal trainer does not employ tension, you need to get a new personal trainer because likely you're not growing any muscles whatsoever because tension is a part of our physical endurance, right? So the, the, the trainer is going to get you on a machine and, and turn up the tension, whether it's an elliptical or a, a treadmill or whether you're bench pressing or you're, you're, you're lifting the dumbbells or whatever it is. The, 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 the trainer is going to employ tension and the tension is going to increase because as the tension increases, your muscles have greater endurance. That's what physical training is all about. And the same is true about spiritual training. And, and Peter knew that because in First Peter... 510, it says, after you've suffered a little while, after the tension, after the training, 1 Peter 510 says, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and you will, and he will place you on a firm foundation. Your tolerance for tension determines your potential for growth. You see, we talked about those scenes in the movie where the conflict hits, that, 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 that the great thing is birthed out of. You know what's crazy? Even the feel-good movies, even even the Lifetime movies, the Hallmark movies, the Notebook, the not just the shoot 'em up movies, not not just the Jason Statham movies, you know, right? Not just the Born Identity or the or what's his name, um, the Keanu Reeves. Oh man, I'm gonna it's gonna bother me. Uh, you know it, and you're saying it, you're screaming it to me, right? John Wick. Um, even not, not just those movies, even in the feel-good kinds of movies. We need a conflict. We need a crisis. Because it's out of those things that we end up crying, the, oh my goodness, they, they were healed, oh my goodness. The relationship was saved, and if it wasn't saved, oh my goodness, they found love again. We need the conflict, but did you know that you and I, we have a tendency to pray away the very things that are the ingredients for the parts that are the best. We want to pray away the conflict, and. And yet the conflict is what births the best things. It's not easy. It's not hard. We, we feel the tension. And, and if you're going through it, I just want to say to you, you, don't pray away the conflict. In fact, let me just ask you and invite you to pray something crazy this year in 2023. Maybe your prayer could say, Dear God, increase the quality of my problems. Let me say it again. Dear God, increase the quality of my problems. Before I unpack that, the other option is, dear God, take away my problems. And, and I don't know, maybe you have access to a prayer line that I don't. So I'm going to bat phone to God. But, but when I pray for him to take away my problems, he doesn't seem interested in that. He, he doesn't seem to want to take away my problems. He wants to use my problems and the conflict to show me his presence in the middle of it and, and to create rivers in the wasteland, not get rid of the wasteland. And, and so maybe our prayer family could be, dear God, increase the quality of my problems. Let me see what you're doing early on in the conflict. Let me see what you're up to early on in, in the challenge. Increase the quality of my problem so that I step into the, the, the understanding, being reminded that I would remind my spirit that God is up to something. God is not abandoning me. He's not leaving me here. That this problem is an opportunity for God to do something new. Secondly, let me just invite you, the, the, the first one, 
was the tension is where the best part of the story is birthed. And then secondly, don't stop the story just because it's a good chapter. In, in Hebrews chapter 11, 39 and 40, so if you know Hebrews 11, we call it like the hall of faith, the hall of fame of people that, that man just killed it in the Old Testament for the sake of, of, of building and, and moving forward the covenant, the old covenant, being faithful to the old covenant, the covenant that, that was all about obedience, all about getting it right and making the right sacrifices and being and, and finding God in the right places. And, and then in Hebrews 11 is all about enlisting the people that did all these amazing things under the old covenant. But then it ends in, in verse 39, it says, all of these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. They earned a good reputation because of their faith. Let me just pause and say, I'm so thankful. Maybe you can stop and be thankful that I'm not trying to earn a good reputation anymore. Because these people, they had to earn a good reputation. And depending on what time of day it is, depending on what I'm feeling, depending on the, the stresses of my life, I might not be doing a very good job earning a good reputation. But these men and women in Hebrews chapter 11, they actually killed it. And they're listed as the, the ones who did like, out crazy things for the kingdom of God. And then it says, after it says they earned a good reputation because of their faith, it says, yet none of them received all that God had promised. They received a good thing. Oh, a great thing. A good reputation with the king of kings, the God of the universe, the, the creator, the sustainer. They received a good reputation. The, 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 the one who sits on the throne of creation is going, you have a good reputation in my book, in my eyes. That, that's a, a good thing. But the writer of Hebrews says, yeah, but they didn't get the best thing. Verse 40 says, for God has something better. It says, God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. See, God does good things, but God wants to do better things, and you and I can have a tendency to hold on to the good thing, and, and we might miss the better thing. I, I, maybe I might even say it like, the good thing can actually threaten the better thing that God wants to do. Let's see if I can say it like this. That passage of the scripture that I just read talks about their faith. Well, we know because of Ephesians that it, because of our faith, now it's by faith that we're saved, not of works, lest anyone should boast, right? No, it's not. It's actually by grace through faith. Faith unlocks this thing called grace that gives us righteousness. So we, we still need to have faith, but that faith unlocks the, the grace that gives us right standing with God right now. Not, not our works so, so that anyone should boast. So there's a tension Right there, see, they had to earn a good reputation because of their works. So their faith gave them a good reputation. See if I can unpack this for you a little bit without making it extra confusing. And then now in the new covenant, the better covenant, the covenant that God reserved for us, it says we now know that faith just unlocks the grace that we get. But even in that, there's a tension because it's not of works lest any man should boast. So we have to fully rely in faith and, with, and lean not in our own understanding, Proverbs says, so that we can have now righteous the righteousness of God. Yet there's a tension there because James also says that faith without works is useless. And so there's a tension there that we are stepping into that's a better thing but yet it's a tense thing. In, in, in Acts, let me see if I can explain this to you a little bit more. In, in Acts chapter 11, verse 1 and 3, now the new covenant is birthed through faith. We're saved by grace through faith. And, and now a new covenant, that's a better covenant than the old covenant that was works-oriented. Now we have a grace-oriented covenant. And, and in Acts chapter 11, the Jews are excited about this better thing. Because before it was all about obedience and sacrifice and, and that's how they earn good reputation. Now they've been given grace and so the Jews are like, wow, this is amazing. We don't have to make these sacrifices. Jesus came and was the once and for all sacrifice. He was the Messiah and then God says, yeah, but I'm still not done. I want to do another better thing. Acts chapter 11, 1 through 3. Soon the news reached the apostles and other believers in Judea that the Gentiles had received the word of God. The Gentiles had received the word of God. And unless you have Jewish ancestry, that's you and me. So you and I were still excluded in the early days of the new covenant because it was just for the Jews. And then the Jews hear that the Gentiles are invited in on this thing and the Jews are unwilling to allow the Gentiles in because they like the good thing. And God says, I'm trying to do a better thing. The better thing threatened 
their good thing. And it says in verse 2 of chapter 11, when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. You entered the home of Gentiles and you even ate with them, they said. They couldn't get to the new thing, the better thing, the thing that allows you and I, those that don't have Jewish ancestry, into the miracle of redemption through Jesus. They didn't want that to happen because they like the new good thing. And God says, yeah, but I'm trying to do a better thing. So I need you to hold that good thing loosely. Just because you're in a good season does not mean that God is done, family. Don't get apathetic. Sometimes we can hold on to God's blessing so tight that we see the new thing he is doing as a threat. In, in, in Leviticus 26, verse 10, I love this. You will have such a surplus of crops that you will need to clear out the old grain to make room for the new harvest. You will have such a surplus of crops that you will need to clear out the old grain to make room for the new harvest. You know what I like about this is is it's, it, it requires you and I to get involved on the thing that God is doing. God, God is saying, don't hold on to the old. I want to give you fresh. And and you're, you, if you're like me, you're like, but God, I'm good. This is comfortable. I, 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 got, I got grain. I don't really want to go clean out that storehouse, nor do I want to go harvest. I've got what I need right now. And God is saying, no, get up, hold loosely the old thing, Clear out, be willing to clear out the storehouses. Do the work to get rid of the old thing to make way for the new thing. And then in the new thing, you're going to have to go out and harvest it and get it. But it will be worth it. Don't hold the good so tight that you don't make room for the new thing that God wants to do. God is a God of new. Maybe mumble, amen, nod your head, <laughs> blink, blink once if you agree. God is a God of the new. So quickly, the hard parts in our story are part of the new thing God is doing. That was the first thing. The second thing, to paraphrase, hold even the blessings of God loosely because he's a God of new. And then number three, don't forget who the author is. I, I need this one most days. If you're like me, it's, we have a, we, we have a, I have a propensity to look at I'm authoring in my life and, and Hebrews picks up from you know, the chapter 11 where we just read about the heroes of the faith and Hebrews chapter 12, verse two says that we look to Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith. The author and the finisher of our faith. This is not your story. He needs to be the one that we give the pen to or the, the typewriter to or the keyboard to of our life because he's writing it and, and he, is the one that writes the beginning, the ending, chapter one, chapter 50, chapter 68. We need to be willing to remember that God is the author and the finisher of our faith. And he wants to do new things because we serve a God that's a creative God that wants to take the canvases of our life, the blank pages of our life, and write his story. And his story is gonna be a good story because he's a good God and we are his kids. And he is a God that wants to do new things. That's my, my favorite verse is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It's not always been my favorite verse, I'd say it's, one of my favorite verses in this season of my life, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I know it from the King James Version. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. It says that word twice. If anyone is in Christ, the better way, the, the way that, that even though the Jews didn't want to invite us into it, God has a way of doing his better thing, and then I got invited into it, and now I'm a new creation in Christ, and behold, all thing, old things are passed away, and all things have become new. The word there for new is, is kainos, on both news. It's different verb tenses, but the word is kainos, and that means recently made, fresh, unused, and unworn. Recently made, fresh, unused, unworn. Those, those are the words that describe me being made new. Uh, do you feel worn out? you feel used up? you feel... Life is full of old news. We serve a God that's authoring our story to do a new thing. And what does it say? His mercies are new. What? How many? How often? Once a week? Twice a year? No, his mercies are new every single morning. And it's those mercies that are constantly making us new every day. So you feel worn out, used up. There's one that wants to make you brand new and he has to make you new because in order to, for our lives to be able to hold the new things that God wants to do, we have to be being made 
new. That word in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the kainos, is Jesus uses this word in a peculiar passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 9. It's, I can't really unpack the whole teaching that Jesus is trying to do, but I do want to go to a verse and, and unpack the principle here. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, the, the, the word that I just said, kainos, that, that means recently made, fresh, unused, and when Jesus uses this word, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, Jesus says, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in, here's this word, Kanos wineskins, new wineskins, recently made, fresh, unused, and unworn wineskins so that both are preserved. The, the timing of, of what Jesus said, oh, it makes a ton of sense on, on, on deeper investigation, but at first glance, it can be kind of confusing. What is Jesus talking about? And, and, and I, I wanted to invite you to prepare yourself for the new thing that God wants to do, but, but he talks about the new wine that he wants to put in, in new wineskins. This, we don't know what that means much in our context. My wife took a job at Rendezvous Winery working like once a month just for fun. She's on Zoom all day, every day. And, and so it gives her a chance to interact with people and have conversations. And so she's learned a ton about the winemaking process and teaches me all about it. But what, what Jesus is referring to is is something like this, and I know if you're listening on a podcast, I just did a wine skin on Amazon and came up with something like this. Obviously, the the wine skins that Jesus is referring to would just be very simply like the skin of a goat wrapped up and, and it would hold wine. It's not going to be latex line like this is with what's considered a leak-proof cap here. But this is the visual I wanted to offer of a, of a wine skin. And, and the reason Jesus is saying this has to be new is because of the fermentation process. Fermentation is basically very much so something that is alive, taking life. And if you know, if you do like, let's say sauerkraut, for instance, I learned this this week, a little bit about the fermentation process. If you, if you do, if you like to make sauerkraut, sauerkraut is very simply cabbage and salt put into a mason jar. I learned this this week. If you put cabbage and salt into a mason jar, the fermentation process is going to create gases and eventually that mason jar is going to explode and send shards of glass all over your kitchen because the fermentation process is one that is alive and it stretches and it expands and, and so you need a fermentation jar which can release the gases. In, in the process of making wine, winemakers take juice and they add yeast to it, and that initiates the fermentation process. So now this wine is alive. And what Jesus was talking about when he said this is, you can only use a wineskin that has new wine in it one time because you put new wine in the wineskin, and as the fermentation process begins, this stretches out, and, and uh, every it's going to create nooks and crannies in the leather, and and wine's going to find its way into every stretch. It's going to take on a form that's no longer this flat thing, but it's going to have bulges, and it's going to be hard because the gases are inside of here. And the fermentation process is going to basically wear this leather out. Because the fermentation process is, is, is an alive thing and it changes what's happening inside of this thing. What Jesus is saying is that there's a new thing that he wants to do and if you put it in something old, it's, it's worn out and it can't take the pressure of the new thing. Did you know that you, you and I, if you're like me, if you're like me, I like when, when I say, God, here's, here's, my, here's my dreams, here's my hopes, here's my desires, here's my prayer list, here's... Here's what I hear. Here's if you'll just sign on the dotted line, you and I are going to do great things together, God. I don't, I don't say it out loud like that, but I, my heart goes there sometimes. Maybe yours does too. And, and really, what I'm saying is, God, just fit into the nooks and crannies of my life. And, but, but that kind of invitation doesn't, there's no change in that. There's, that's, that's a dead, lifeless faith. And what Jesus is saying is, I need to be making you new every day because I want to do something that is alive inside of you. Oh, it's going to push. It might be hard. 
It's going to force for you to stretch in ways that you don't want to with the life-changing power of the gospel. If it wasn't stretching and changing, it would be useless. And so God is saying to you and to me, I want to make you new so that you can hold the alive thing that I want to do inside of you. God says, I want to do good in your life. I don't want to harm you. I've got plans, but they're not to harm you. And in order for the plans that God wants to form inside of you to be able to survive, you and I have to be willing to be made new. Otherwise, we would burst under the pressure and God's not, God's not going to burst us under the pressure. So I wonder what, what, what new, the new year could bring for you. I wonder if there's a prayer that could say, God, I feel used up. I feel worn out. And you're saying you want to make me new. And I want to be ready to receive the new thing 2023 has. And I want for the power of the gospel to be alive. I don't want to water down. I don't want grape juice in my wine skin. I want an alive new wine that is the move of God in my life. And I know I need to be made new in order to receive that. So. God, make me new. And maybe for, maybe someone else is like, I've got, I got, I got a great vintage. I got a reserve, a phenomenal reserve vintage that that my life is holding right now. Life is good. Well, can I just uh, praise God? I'm so so thankful for that. But will you be about waking up every morning? Say, God, don't don't let me, don't let me be eating the grain from last year. That I'm not willing to clean it out and to invite a new and a better thing this year. So family, I hope that just encourages you as you start this new year that we serve a God that wants to do a God, uh, do a new thing. He's a, he wants to do, he's a God of the new things and he wants to do new things in this new year in our life. For some, it's rivers in the wasteland. For others, it's pouring out the old and saying, make me new and let's do something brand new. Stretch my life. So I have the fullness of all that you want. John 10, 10, right? The thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But you come, you come to take my life, to fill it up abundantly. Oh, stretch me to be the man or the woman that you want me to be this year. Do something new in me. I love you. I love you, church. Uh, right now, if you're listening to this and you just want to take that, that step with me, Maybe you want to need it for the very first time accept Jesus and say, I want to be made new for the very first time. I just want to encourage you. Even right now, whether you're walking your dog or listening in your car, maybe you probably drove to work unless you, like my buddy Rick, who works in Vacaville, so I'm, I'm 30 minutes in, so he, he, he's probably still got half his drive. And Whatever you're doing right now, maybe you're pulled over because you got to where you need to be, but maybe you could just say for the first time, Make me new. I want, I want the fullness of what the gospel has to bring to my life. Thank you, Jesus, that because of you, I can be made new. And so I trust you th through faith, by grace, to do something brand new in me. I love you, church. I feel grateful to be your pastor, and I am so excited for what 2023 has in store for us. Happy New Year. Thank you.